Good afternoon. Uh, so with a great deal of pleasure that I uh, introduce Barack Barfi, a, a friend and a colleague here at New America who's a research fellow specializing in, in Arab and Islam Islamist affairs. He was pre previously a visiting fellow with uh, the Brookings Doha Center. Before that, he was a producer with ABC News affiliates in the Middle East, where he reported from countries such as Iraq and Lebanon. His articles have appeared in many publications, including the Washington <coughs> Post and Foreign Policy uh, and the New Republic, all frequent collaborators with uh, the New America Foundation. He's recently visited Egypt and Syria, where he visited the province of Aleppo and met with rebel leaders. And uh, Barack spent six months in Libya during the 2011 revolution. So he's going to speak uh, for about 15 minutes. I'm going to engage him in a little Q&A and then throw it open to you. Thank you, Barack. Uh, thank you very much, Peter, for taking the time out to moderate this. I uh, also want to take a moment to remember a friend, uh, Munzer Ali Abrad. Uh, him and his family welcomed me uh, when I was in the province of Aleppo. And uh, recently he was killed in uh, fighting uh, in the city of Aleppo. So I just want to say, uh, I want to start today by talking about Libya. Uh, the biggest dilemma in Libya is the militia problem. But to understand that, you really need to understand the country's history. Libya has been characterized by weak state institutions. It began in the monarchy that rules from 1951 to 1969. Small coterie around the king uh, controlled the country. Gaddafi continued this. Uh, uh, he was frustrated with the bureaucracy, so he created people's power, where he devolved power to the municipalities, and he dismantled ministries, and he wanted to distribute oil revenues directly to the people to spend rather than have central government planning. This theme was emphasized in 1990, uh, 1988 Green Charter of Human Rights, where it, was, where it was written, quote, the people exercise his power directly without intermediary or representative, unquote. This led to formal versus informal authority that weakened state institutions. Uh, the in 1977, Gaddafi created the Revolutionary Com Committees, which had uh, arrest powers. Then he created uh, revolutionary courts that had um, powers of prosecution and execution. In doing so, he shifted power from legitimate inst in state institutions to revolutionary ones. All these policies make the state virtually non-existent beyond the course of powers of the intelligence services and the extraction and sale of oil. The 2011 revolution continued this. Uh, within uh, days of the revolution, outbreak of the revolution, the National Transitional Council, the NTC, was an opposition group that was established to be the opposition government. Uh, the people there didn't have a lot of governing experience. The, early on, the Libyans were very happy. But over time, we realized there was no transparency and there was no move to dismantle the militias. The militias are the country's, real uh, the country's real power brokers. They are regional and ideological militias. Uh, these militias engage in retribution against Gaddafi loyalists. Uh, there's also intra-militia fighting uh, between in militias from the cities of okay. uh, Zintan and Mishrata. Um, there's also theft. Uh, the, 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 uh, these, uh, these militias have engaged in theft, a lot of car theft, a lot of uh, vandalism and whatnot. So today's dilemmas are that there's no state institutions, there's weak national security forces, and there are strong militias, and that translates into a weak central government. On the political level, we have uh, major regional and ideological troubles. The National Forces Alliance, the NFA, led by former Prime Minister Mahmoud Jibril, uh, they came out on top in the recent elections. But Jibril has a lot of enemies, chief among them the city of Misrata, and the most powerful uh, militias uh, from Libya come from the city of Misrata. There's historical animosity between Jibril's Warfala tribe and uh, the city of Misrata. Jibril is using Qaddafi loyalists from the Warfala tribe. So when his enemies really blocked him from begin becoming prime minister. Into the vacuum stepped an organ, a party called the National Front. It's descended from the, um, the Libyan National Salvation Front. It's the major opposition group that was created in 1981. They were able to get the positions of uh, president and prime minister. Um, because they were the opposition party, they were able to stock the cabinet with exiled dissidents, and this angered the par local parliamentarians. 
We also have uh, the regional parties, such as Mistratins and Tom. These are the cities where the strongest militias came from. They were not happy with the cabinet representation they got either. So what happened, and also there were a number of Qaddafi loyalists uh, that were given posts. So a lot of people, they said, A, we don't know these people because they came from abroad. B, they're Qaddafi loyalists. And C, we don't have regional representations. And that basically undermined and torpedoed the Mustafa Abu Shagur's uh, Prime Minister Mustafa Abu Shagur's government, and now the, the country has no prime minister when it's dealing with the biggest crisis that uh, any, uh, since the revolution with the Benghazi consulate attack. Uh, I want to now talk about Syria. Since, since history was written in the third uh, century BCE, his, Syria has been historically unstable. We had waves of nomads and nomadic invaders. We had the mountains offering uh, refuge to persecuted minorities. Uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the independence era, we never had a cohesive state. There were coups and counter coups every few years. And this basically led to what the, uh, the um, journalist Patrick Steele called the struggle for Syria. This really changed with Hafez al-Assad when he came to 1970. He created strong uh, central government uh, that provided people stability and security in exchange for them giving up uh, freedoms. And he built a coalition of minorities that was buffeted by the rural Sunni poor. But when the revolution began, uh, this many, of this, many members of this coalition began to unravel. When we saw protests in cities, in, in Sunni urban cities, such as Hama and Homs, uh, that was not to be, that was no surprise because these areas uh, rose up in the insurrection in the late, Islamist insurrection in the late 1970s and early 1980s. Uh, the Sunnis there were very upset because the regime brought in Alawis from the northwest, uh, northwest areas of Jabal Alawi, the, where they, the Alawis predominate, and they sell them in these areas. So they were, they were usurping, usurping a lot of their privileges. Uh, but now when we see protests in rural Sunni areas that were uh, pillars of the regime's support, th that means that there's a lot of trouble for the regime. But we shouldn't estimate the staying power of the regime. Many people still support it. People don't want instability. A lot of people don't understand what the revolution is about. When I was in the province of Aleppo, there were certain areas that uh, my Syrian friends uh, didn't want to take us because they said they were either pro-regime or they sat on the fence. And these were Sunni villages. We're not talking about Aliwi villages, minority villages, or Shi'i villages. Um, from time to time, we hear that the re uh, regime is on the brink of collapse, but no cities have fallen to the rebels. The regime can still use its air power. The core pillars of support for the regime are still there. The rebels are very good. Uh, they know how to fight. They know how to have sustained assaults. There's coordination between different brigades. They know how to gather intelligence. They know how to plot sophisticated attacks using different types of weapons. I didn't see this during my six months of Libya, where the, the rebels would move forward during the day and they'd fall back at night. They didn't hold positions. You see a lot, a, a lot of difference with the rebels in Syria. Jihadists have been spotted on the front lines in considerable numbers. There are some Westerners there. We know of jihadist camps that are being run. A lot of attention has fallen on an organization called Jabhat al-Nusra. It's drawing in young Syrians. The Free Syrian Army, uh, as it's called, but not really, doesn't really exist, is not happy about it. We hear of disputes between nationalist Syrians and more ideological, nationalist Syrian units and more ideological ones. Qatar and Saudi Arabia are thundering units that tow their line. Uh, they may be getting better weapons. The regime is not going to collapse and wither away as we saw in Iraq and Libya. Its core is based on sects that live in compact regions. They have legitimate interests and concerns the international community needs to address. If Damascus falls, the Alawis are going to move to the northern regions of uh, Latakia and Tartus, where the Alawis predominate. This will give them a coastal area and a border with Lebanon, where Hezbollah will be able to fund them and provide them with services. This is why they, the regime moved chemical weapons there, because they could not allow for those areas to, be, to fall and be slaughtered and massacred. I finally want to finish by talking about uh, Egypt. 
the Muslim Brotherhood. There's internal struggles within the organization between a core group that wants to stay true to the group's ideals and another one that knows that governing necessitates changes. The group can't decide what it wants to focus on, and as a result, its messaging is muddled. The Islamists really stumbled out of the gate. Uh, when I talk about this, I'm not talking so much about the Muslim Brotherhood as I am about uh, the Salafi party al-Nur. The Muslim Brotherhood had years of political experience in organization, and they, they had representation in the parliament. Uh, but the Salafists didn't. They're new to politics. And too many Salafists and really Muslim Brother candidates won. And they just don't know how to be good politicians. So what we need to do in this situation is look back at other countries where religious uh, parties came to power in very large numbers to understand what happened, give a precedent paradigm. A great example of this is Israel, the Shas party, led by, uh, it's an Orientalist Jew party that's led by uh, rabbis. When this party started winning uh, large seats in large numbers in the late 1980s and 1990s, it had to move people into the Knesset or parliament that didn't have political experience. They were second-tiered political hacks. And what happened is a number of these people, they, when they came, to, they came into the Knesset and they saw the powers uh, that they could have, they took advantage of them. And a, lot, a number of the uh, members of Shah's party went to prison on charges, corruption charges, including its leader, Arya Derry. We're already seeing the beginnings of, of uh, disenchantment and the problems with the Salafist al Nur party. One of the MPs was caught in, in a car with a woman in a late hour in a deserted area. Another one uh, came to, to Parliament with bandages on his nose. He said he was beat up. It turned out he had plastic surgery. These people are supposed to be pious Muslims that set an example for the society. And, but the, what we're seeing is they are being tempted and corrupted by the same uh, temptations that, that, that um, undermine the secular politicians during the Mubarak regime. Egypt's dilemma is that it just can't, it's a, it, you can't govern a society that's ungovernable. No political party can fix Egypt's political woes. There's too many people, not enough jobs, and not enough agricultural resources. Egypt is falling into the Nile. <laughs> the people are frustrated. It's not only the slow pace of political change that is frustrating them. This summer there were widespread electrical shortages. People want responsive government, and that is just not going to happen in a country like Egypt. We hear a lot about the lack of security. The police are on the street after the uh, revolution. People are being robbed. One of the big things that the paper, when I was in Egypt this summer in the papers, uh, the people were getting beat up at hospitals. They were just coming in and just beating people up. Uh, that's another thing that's frustrating people. Shifting back to politics, Egypt makes the man. President Mohamed Morsi has been criticized as an uncharismatic leader and a consolation prize that the Brotherhood put forward when its chief strategist, Hayrat al Shatra, was disqualified from running for president. Morsi was described as, quote, a spare tire, unquote. These sound much like the criticisms against Anwar al Sadat when he succeeded uh, Gamal Abdel Nasser in 1970. But Sadat quickly made his mark on society and chartered a policy course no one will ever forget. First, by by, the, um, by, the, by his participation in the 1973 war, where the Egyptian forces crossed the Suez Canal and really brought pride back to Egypt after the disaster, the catastrophe of 1967 war. And secondly, the Camp David Accords. The question worrying Washington is whether the revolution will lead to Egypt shifting out of America's orbit. To answer this, we need to look at Egypt's history. Nasser wanted to be un unaligned when he came to power. He was very close with Tito from Yugoslavia and Nehru from India. But by the time he died in 1970, Russian fighter pilots were skirmishing with Israelis over Sinai, and Russian was virtually a second language in Alexandria because the city was staffed with so many Russian advisors. In Egypt, economic policy drives foreign policy. First it was the Russians, and now it's the Americans. If Morsi Sheikh ah shakes Ahmadinejad's hand at a, at a conference in Iran, it doesn't matter because when Ob President Obama calls him and gives him a dressing down, Morsi does what the president tells him to do. Because economic policy drives foreign policy, Egypt's not going to find new friends like China to help him out. You know, it was a, a uh, Morsi had a big trip to China recently. China can't provide 
Egypt the billions of dollars in aid that it needs. Countries like Saudi Arabia and Qatar have a lot of the money that Egypt needs, but they're just been slow to dole it out. The only America, only America has the experience and resources to provide Egypt with the aid that it needs. Uh, finally, I want to talk briefly about the Sinai Peninsula. Foreign jihadists are moving in there. Uh, recently, we had 16 soldiers die in attacks. There have been cross-border raids into Israel. This is a dilemma that's not going to go away for a long time. The Egyptian army just is not prepared to deal with this threat, doesn't have experience in counterterrorism and counterinsurgency operations. During the Islamist uh, insurrection of the 1990s, um, the, Egyptian, uh, the, the government relied on the police forces and the intelligence services to put down the rebellion, not the military. Um, also, one of the problems, it relies on an organization called the Central Security Forces. These are the people, according to this Camp David Accords, Egypt had to demilitarize the Sinai. So on the border, in what's called Area C, there are no, there are no soldiers. There are only people from this organization called the Central Security Forces, or the CSF. These people are rejects that couldn't get into army, but still need to serve their, their uh, mandatory military um, conscription. Uh, and these are the people that are basically on the front lines. So uh, because the military does not have experience dealing with the jihadists, so what happened? It needed to respond to, to, society's, uh, to society's anger after the soldiers were killed, so it just bombed uh, a base. And anybody that, knows, that has experience with uh, counterterrorism and counterinsurgency knows that the first thing you want is to capture someone because they can give you uh, information and intelligence about an organization. When you, when you drop bombs on people, you're not going to get anything. Uh, and now we, we, what we're hearing is that was they, when they dropped the bombs, there was nobody even there. Because when, if, you're, if people die, they said that there, there were deaths on, on the side of the jihadists. When there's deaths on the side of the jihadists, they would usually have funerals that follow. And locals there said there were no funerals. So the jihadist problem is not going to go away. And basically, the army doesn't have an uh, answer for it. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Brad, what's your understanding of what happened at Benghazi at the American consulate? Um, what happened in Benghazi had nothing to do with the protests. Uh, the, the, we know, based on discussions with uh, people that were there that night, it was a highly sophisticated attack. Uh, the, the coordination, the, the weapons that the people used, and Sorry. Uh, the, 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 these, the uh, blame has fallen on an organization called Ansar al-Sharia, and this was a very small uh, brigade that uh, is not as strong as the, the regional brigades such as Mistrat and Zintan. It's also not as strong as uh, more ideologically based ones like February 17th uh, and, and Dear Libya, Libya Shield, which are the strong ones. And for an organization, to, to put the blame on an organization like Ansar al-Sharia, that can't fight on the level of those other organizations is, is just uh, missing the point. Uh, as more and more information comes out, we're going to learn that about organizations and movements that were involved that have a lot more to do than just being uh, in Libya. Meaning what? Meaning that there, there, there's, there's, it's very likely that there was a foreign component that was driving what happened uh, on the ground that night. Um, in your view, having spent six months in Libya after the Gaddafi's fall, I mean, um, do you think the attack on the consulate is sort of an outlier or sort of represents the future of Libya? It's an excellent question. The, the problem in Libya is that there's just no security. And we, we saw this in the, the regional security report that came out in the congressional testimony recently. And the security situation is much worse than we first imagined based on some of, some of these documents. Um, the, the security services can't provide any level of security. Uh, there's, there's, ret there's retribution against Gaddafi loyalists. There's um, all types of attacks against people that you don't like, you, you, just, you, just, you just clip them like Soprano style. So uh, what's going to happen, and, and also what we need to look at is historically what happened in Libya. Historically, and I'm talking 
really since uh, foreigners came in, the Phoenicians and the Romans, they've always controlled the coastal areas. And the, ins the, the hinterlands have always been controlled by tribes or, or, or groups or movements that were opposed to the government. Only really with the Qaddafi, when Qaddafi took power and he established a real regime, was he able to extend power into the hinterlands, uh, and authority into the hinterlands. And now with the, with the, since the revolution, we've seen a re recession of that power. The government authority has receded, and it's only in some coastal areas, and not even that. And because there's no national security services, they can't provide any type of security and stability. The, at this point in time, if the United States gave the, the Libyans the names and the places of where these people were, it's highly, un of the perpetrators of the attack, it's highly unlikely that they could apprehend them without really good training from the Americans, and even possibly having American special forces on the ground helping them. But do you have a sense of how chaotic Libya is? I mean, if, if Iraq 2007 is sort of like a 10, or Iraq 2006 is a 10, and uh, you know, where, where would you score this present situation in Libya? Well, I spent a lot of time in Iraq uh, during the war there, and I saw the security situation progressively deteriorate in the slippery slope. I think that we're really at the beginning, right after the, the, the uh, American occupation in 2003, uh, towards right before April 2004, when you had the, uh, the incidents in Fallujah and the attacks against Muqtar al-Sadr. Uh, so we're seeing a progressive deterioration of the situation in Libya, and if the government doesn't step up and really establish authority soon, we could see, we could see what happens in Iraq really after April 2004. But what are the differences? I mean, does, is there a Shia-Sunni component in Libya? My impression was not, not much compared to Iraq, right? Well, it's, uh, our population is homogeneous. It's right. about, I think, 90% Arab and about 10% Sunni Arab, and, uh, and the rest are Berbers and Tuaregs and taboo minorities. So you're not going to see that minority split. There's, uh, the loyalists are weak. Uh, the Qaddafi loyalists, they, 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 do, they are engaged in some type of attacks, but they're not as strong as, as what we saw the insurgency at the beginning of, of Iraq. But what we're going to see is we're going to see this weak central government not, doesn't have control over the entire country, and that invites foreign jihadists in to establish camps yeah. that you can't really take on. But, I mean, do you have a sense of the scale of that? Is that a marginal problem? Is that a growing problem? Is that an exaggerated problem? I mean, what... Well, the thing is, we, 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 we thought there were small numbers of, Libyan, of foreigners early on and that uh, they were just a, a nuisance uh, until the, until the, the, the attack. Right. And then we were shocked by the level of sophistication. Well, that goes back to the question. So you're saying then that the attack was not an outlier, but is perhaps a harbinger? Uh, it, it's possible that there could be more attacks like this if, if, if there, if, in, in the future. And when you say foreigners, I mean, where are these, where are they from? Well, that's the thing. We don't know exactly where they're from, but the people who were involved in the attack, uh, d they don't appear, based on uh, discussions with the people who were there that night, just don't fit in with being uh, Libyans. Um, let's turn to Aleppo for a minute. I mean, tell me, tell us, tell you, we, C-SPAN is also, um, on uh, recording this. Tell the audience um, kind of what you did in Aleppo, what you saw, what kind of risks you took, the kind of dangers that independent researchers, journalists like yourself face trying to report on the conflict. Well, uh, this was the first conflict that I was in where the side I was on didn't have air supremacy. So you're exposed at 24 hours a day to, um, to a, these type of attacks, and you basically can't run away from a fighter jet. Uh, so that's, that's a problem. I mean, when you were, we were in places like Iraq uh, on American uh, bases, such as al-Assad. You were, you were shelled every night, every day and every night uh, with mortars, and you, you, knew, you came to expect that. And when you go out, you might face an IED at any moment. But you just didn't, you didn't have this constant fear that, the, that the, the, the other side could come out with such strong firepower and get to you anyway. Uh, basically what would happen is um, 
shelling that would be shelled between 11 p.m. and uh, 3 or 4 a.m. Then there would be a, a lull until about 11, 12 p.m. And then the fighter, uh, the helicopters and fighter jets would come out uh, and attack us. And you'd get shelled with uh, long-range cannons and, and some uh, tank shells and, and missiles and whatnot. How did you get into Aleppo? What was that? I mean, without getting into anything that would be um, something that you wouldn't want to say publicly. I mean, how, what was the and what, when did you go exactly? I was there at the beginning of September, and uh, basically at this point in time, the rebels have taken over the checkpoint, the, the border crossings, so you're able to cross over from Turkey and go in and uh, move around. Uh, in, in those areas. But still, there are some roads that are very dangerous because um, some of these roads are near air bases that the regime controls and they shell randomly uh, at uh, vehicles that drive on the road. And what would you say, the, uh, what is the strategy of the Assad regime other than survival? I mean, what, is, what are they trying to, how are they trying, what, is the, what are the tactics and strategies they are using to remain in power? Well, basically, when, when they use the Air Force like this, they're just trying to scare people because it's just it's random bombing with no overall strategy. Many of these bombs fall in fields. Uh, when I was in, one, I was in uh, Tel Rafat, um, L-39 bombed us, and uh, the, the bomb landed in an agricultural field, a farm, which was far from the built-up urban areas. So you wonder, why do they do that? Um, many of these bombings don't lead to any casualties because they're just trying to scare them. They're trying to wear down the, the morale of the rebels and, and, the, and the citizens that support them. And they want them to know that we're here and we're not going away. And, it's and not is that end. proving to be successful? Um, at this point in time, no, it's not being successful. You're not seeing people. To, uh, what it's doing is the regime is turning more and more people away, especially, as I said, in the rural areas. Uh, one of the villages that I was in was a very prosperous village. There was a lot of new building, a lot of building that was stopped. And you think, wow, they, they benefited from the regime policies. It's not a poor village. But what, what, what we're seeing is that it, the regime is turning these civilians who were either on the fence or didn't like the idea of instability that was caused by the revolution and the rebels, it's shifting them towards seeing that the regime is barbaric, so to speak, because of what it's doing. Uh, that's the way a lot, some of these people, these people feel, that they just they don't, they don't trust the regime anymore, and they're very angry that it would go out and target civilians on this level. That said, the regime still has support, and you're not going to see this a lot in the media because you're not going to be able to talk to a lot of these people. And even the journalists that go in on regular visas into Syria, they think that people are saying these things because they're scared. I was able to spend some time with some Syrians when I was in the region from, from Damascus, and they really supported the regime. They did not like the rebels. They did not like what they were doing. They were very upset. And, and what sort of ethnic or class were these people from? These were, these were Sunnis. These were urban Sunnis, uh, middle class Sunnis, and uh, they were just not supportive of the revolution. And you still have that. Like I said, in these villages, some of these villages, Sunni villages in Aleppo, still supported the regime. And what is your, what is your progno prognosis for the regime? Uh, eventually, the, pro the, the regime is, is going to fall. It, it can't, they can't sustain this over the long term. There's, they can't win the war. They've not taken any of the, 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 the rebels haven't taken any of the cities, but the regime is just focused on putting out brush fires in too many places and it can't do it. And it's gradually losing more and more. What would it take um, from, uh, once we get past this election, whether it's a Romney administration or an Obama administration, what, what could that administration do to actually change the facts on the ground? The, the, the next administration need to really understand that this regime has interests, that it has legitimate security concerns, and we have to address them. And we have to give them a, 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 graceful, a soft landing and a graceful exit, and, and let, allow them to move into these Alawi areas. And, and be secure there and have some type of autonomy like the Kurds have in Kurdistan. So you can imagine then a sort of, a, I mean, a, and how, how would that operate? It would be a sort of UN guaranteed safe havens? 
Exactly. You could probably maybe put some a, a buffer, a, a buffer of, of international troops there. The 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 the, the, the Alawis would still be able to hold on to their weapons. They're not going to give up those weapons or the chemical weapons that they move there exactly for that reason. And we give the international community gives them guaranteed assurances. And over a generation or two, that we can then move to integrating that area back into Syria. Otherwise, this problem is not going to go away. And you say they've moved the chemical weapons into the Alawite areas. What's the, uh, the evidence for that? Well, we know that the weapons were moved. And some people thought, oh, because they were going to use them against the, the, uh, the civilian population. But they were most likely moved because to guarantee if, if Damascus falls, that the Alawis could move back into their uh, home, home areas and provinces, and they would be secure because you can't go up against chemical weapons. You can go up against tanks, you can go up against long-range shelling uh, or whatnot, but it, uh, nobody wants to go up against chemical weapons. And so how, and how long was your, this most recent trip? When, when was it exactly? It was in uh, September. For how long? About 10 days. Yeah. And uh, how, how, were you, how did you travel around? Well, I was lucky, like I said, uh, Munzer's family and friends helped us out. They, oh, they opened their villages to us, and they opened their homes to us, and they took us, they took us in, and they, they, they took us around. We were with fighters from their, their units. Uh, the, 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 those family un the families were each in different units, and they, they took care of us. What do you think, you know, uh, our, our colleague Leila Hilal uh, here at New America said that, you know, there, there are believed to be about 800 militias. Are there, you know, are there militias that are particularly viable or particularly successful, or is it, is it just a thicket of you know, small groups that are just each handling their own little region? You know, there are battalions and brigades that are trying to move. Uh, I've spent time in Aleppo, so that's the only place I can talk about. Yeah. The, these organizations are, there, there's, there's an Aleppo military council, and it's got about five, I can't remember, five or six people on there. And then you have the, the brigades there, the <coughs> leaders of the brigades, and then you have uh, units underneath them. So we have a hierarchical structure. I don't know if an order that goes from the top is going to be executed at the bottom, but I do know that there's coordination, there's horizontal coordination bet between these individual units because when they get together, wh when they decide they want to carry an operation, they can, uh, individual unit can't do it alone, a couple hundred fighters. It needs to rely on other units to come together. So you said an interesting thing about comparing, because obviously you spent a lot of time observing the same activities in Libya, that the, the Syrian rebels have a more sophisticated military strategy and tactics than the Libyans. The Libyans would get together at night in Ashrada amongst themselves and talk about what they were going to do the next day, uh, fighting. The, the, the way a, uh, an operation is, is, is planned and carried out on the Syrian side shows a high level of sophistication that people are learning, civilians are learning the intricacies of, of war and how to, how, to, how to scope out a place. How to, how to initially come up with the plan, how to scope out the place, how to decide how many fighters are needed, then what the operation will look like. From the top to the bottom, these guys are getting very good. Well, how would a no-fly zone, an enforced no-fly zone, affect the war in Syria? Basically what the no-fly zone would do initially is the regime has um, bases that are islands in a sea of rebels and they would have to give up these areas because they're using these bases in Aleppo province. I think there's about three or four air bases. It, it has an air corridor so it can, it can shovel supplies there and whatnot. And then it's using that as the base to, to bomb the, the region. Uh, it would have to fall back. It would, it would have to fall back from those areas into predetermined areas that would be of strategic interest for the regime. And that was all that would happen at the beginning. The regime would still have long range, the same problem we saw in Egypt, uh, Libya, the regime would still have long range cans and missiles that the, that the rebels don't have. Like we were attacked with grad missiles uh, and, and a shot on the front lines. The, the regime was using grads to push people back. In Libya? Yeah. What happened in Libya was a very unique situation because the rebels were stopped uh, on the road uh, between Benghazi and, um, and, 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 and between Serenica and, and Tripoli, Benghazi and certain and, and Tripoli. And basically in, in, in Libya, the last army, that uh, last uh, conqueror that, that was able to move from east to west and take uh, the country were the Arabs in the seventh century. It's it hasn't happened since then. 
So these guys got st stalemated on the, on the, in the desert. And then what you had is a unique situation that Misrata rose up, which was the third largest city, and the regime couldn't stomp it out. And the city of Zintan, which was an Arab city in the Jabal Nafucha, which was a Berber area, so there's a lot of cohesiveness amongst these people, and they had an airstrip there, so the Qataris could bring supplies there. These are the things that eventually won the war. When we thought, it, when, when the West thought of a no-fly zone early on, it thought, okay, no-fly zone, the guys would move from east to west. Uh, but then the, 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 the war was stalemated very quickly. And then what you ha we saw was a gradual escalation. The, you went from fixed wing um, uh, planes to helicopters. The French brought in the helicopters a couple months later because they needed more precision and be able to, to, to bomb those um, uh, regime targets. And then you brought spotters on the ground uh, and you brought special forces, uh, Western special forces, to work with the, with the rebels. There was a gradual escalation. And, and do you think that should happen in Syria, or what's your view? I think that what we, the, the problem in, in Syria is if you, we go to the no-fly zone, there's no guarantee that that will lead to a rebel victory. What we need to do is work, try to work and find a negotiated settlement with the regime that gives them a soft landing at this point in time. Mm. Do you think the regime, I mean, the regime has had plenty of time to, to think about sort of a negotiated settlement? Do you think, do they have any appetite for one? I think that what, what the regime has made many bad decisions along the way. I think there were many points along the way that it could have reduced tensions and, and even maybe ended the war, and it hasn't done that. It hasn't shown the, the, the strategic um, sagacity and insights that a man like Hafez al-Assad would have. The new generation just doesn't have that. Well, it's an interesting form of sagacity, his... Uh half his other side in terms of his approach to dealing with internal dissent. Well, he, he did rule for 30 years in a country where no, no leader ruled for five years since independence in, 19, well, I think, 1946. But uh, his son seems to have adopted the same approach pretty much wholesale, right? Which is uh, repression, if it's at a sufficiently high level, seems to, seems to work. Well, see, the thing is, he, he didn't move. He, it, it, well, that goes back to the Powell, Powell Doctrine. If you're going to use force, you've got yeah. to come out strong with it early on. And, and he didn't do that. There was a slow escalation. All right. So there so should have been hammer rules, as Friedman says. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I, don't, I, I, I don't advocate uh, yeah. I, I don't advocate violence. But maybe Hafez, you know, Hafez gets a, uh, he gets a raw deal. Uh, he, he wasn't this ruthless, um, uh, sadistic man like Saddam was that just mm. wanted violence every day. He wanted stability, and he did allow pockets of stability. He allowed professional syndicates to exist, some level of, of civil society in a country like Libya, where Saddam didn't. He's somewhere between Saddam and the authoritarian leaders of the Republican regime, such as Mubarak in, uh, in Egypt and Ben Ali. In, in Tunisia and in, in Saleh and in Yemen or whatnot. So the, he, he's, he has that middle ground, and he, he, really, he really gets a bum rap. I mean, if you read the conversations, uh, like the Clinton tapes, uh, he, he, he's expressing concerns and fears to Clinton, and Clinton is very sympathetic with these things. So he, 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 what Hafez needed was a much better PR organization to help him out. Um, okay. What, did, by the way, is that Patrick Seal? Is that Patrick Seal? Is that well? <laughs> Patrick Patrick focused too much on the conspiracy theories of of wh why certain things happened uh, in the region. Um, turning to Egypt, you've interviewed a lot of uh, people in the jihadi movement in Egypt relatively recently. What's the um, and you mentioned the 1990s, obviously, where the you know basically the Egyptians put down a sort of Islamist mini Islamist insurgency and, and also. These jihadi groups lost all their popular, I mean, I think the Luxor massacre in 97, where 56 tourists were hunted down and stabbed to death, uh, kind of was the end of the jihadi movement. Which, by the way, the leadership was against. Of the uh, Islamic group. In, in prison. Yeah, yeah. Well, they were much more. So the question is, you know, is there any likelihood of, let's say, Ayman al-Zawari, the head of al-Qaeda, being able to sort of resuscitate an al-Qaeda-like group in Egypt, or is there other jihadi groups, or have Egyptians sort of gone through that in the 1990s and seen that that was sort of a dead end? Um, how do you see the sort of militant movement in, in Egypt playing out? Well, here's the thing. First of all, all of Ayman's friends have entered the political process. They renounced violence. Right. Okay? So what you have is 
and both in the Islamic Jihad and the Gamma Islamia, the uh, Islamic group, they, the, the leaders, and then the mid-level guys, all embraced the political process. First, they started with the ceasefire in 1997. They renounced violence. And gradually, over the next decade, a lot of these people were released, like such as uh, Karam Zuhdi, which was, who was the ideologue of the, of the, uh, the Gamma and Najah Ibrahim. And then after the revolution on the Islamic Jihad side, the uh, Zumer brother and cousin. So these people then moved straight into politics. And Mohammed al-Zawari, uh, Ayman's brother, is out of jail now. Yeah, Muhammad is a, is a different, uh, he's cut from a different cloth. What cloth is that? Well, he wasn't in the prison with those people at the time. These people, there was a transformation in the 1980s and 1990s. I spoke to one of them, he said, we were young. We didn't understand things. We went and we read books. This was a guy who was friends with Khalid Islambuli, the man who assassinated Sadat. I mean, talking about the, lead, the, the, the most senior people saying we were wrong. And this, start, this process started in 1997. So what happened is you have the, these organizations enter the political process. You have fringe elements from these groups that were not leaders. They were not political leaders. They were not military leaders. They were not administrative leaders. They decided we're not going to play that game. We want to cling to our jihadi roots. They don't have the experience now to really create new organizations. It's going to take them a lot of time when they want to do that. And we have signs of some of these people on the ground trying to move, trying to shift and operate. Uh, you know, all these people who were released uh, in March 2011 is when the, the prisons were opened. Me with signs meaning what? Certain people have come up on radars, um, and the people that follow uh, these things, and they, they, there's a cause for concern that some of the, that these people are establishing camps, they're, they're going out, they're trying to radicalize the population. Establishing camps where? Uh, some in Libya and some in Egypt. And they're, yeah, Egyptians. Yes. And do they call themselves Al-Qaeda or what are they, I mean, how do they self-identify? I don't think that they call themselves Al-Qaeda. From what I understand, they want to be Al-Qaeda. Any sense of size? I can't give you a, an estimate on the, the size. Have they done anything in Egypt? Have any note? Well, you know, in si we, 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 we see um, the jihadists in Sinai uh, have already carried out several attacks. But that, w that was true um, before the regime fell. I mean, there were all those attacks on the Israeli hotels in yeah, Sinai. And but they thought they stomped it out. Yeah. They, they killed uh, all the ringleaders of those attacks. Great, let's throw it open to the audience. Uh, can you wait for the microphone so, and identify yourself and ask a question rather than making a statement? Jennifer, this gentleman here. I'm Tom Getman, a former NGO executive and OCHA board member in the Middle East. Thanks for the extraordinary detail. Um, we're wondering more about uh, what's happening in the northern part of Syria in regard to Turkey. Now, you mentioned that it's an open border. Now you can come and go again like early on. And I'm wondering with the Russian uh, confiscated plane and the shelling, what your assessment is of Turkey's future in the conflict. And just on a personal note, how badly damaged is historic Aleppo? Yeah, it's, Turkey's got a big dilemma on its hands. Um, first of all, You've seen the influx of refugees. They don't have the infrastructure to, to, to host them. The conditions of the camps, some of these camps is very bad. You have to walk uh, very far to get <coughs> uh, to the bathroom, to sanitary areas. They don't have really have access outside the refugee camps. Another problem that uh, Turkey has is in the region of Hatay, uh, there's a large Alawi community. I think it's about 500,000. I have to look at my notes again. Um, these people don't want to have anything to do with the Syrians. Uh, we had protests every day. Every, I mean, every day they were protests by the left-wing groups um, in, Hata, in Antakya, excuse me, uh, against the, um, against the, the Syrians. Uh, there's, there were marches, I think, w once we got tear gassed at, uh, by the riot police. Uh, Syrians um, have been told, the Syrian refugees have been told, by Turkish authorities, they shouldn't be in certain areas. I mean, for their own good, because the, the, re the locals might beat them up. Um, so the, the Turkey has that problem, and it, 
it, it's trying to push, it's trying to pull the West into this, especially with what happened this week. NATO is, a, a Turkey is a NATO a member of NATO, so any attack against Turkey is attack against uh, every NATO member. But the, 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 the NATO members haven't stepped up to the plate. wonder why that is. Because they don't want to be involved in, in this right, yeah. uh, right now. It's, 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 yeah, um, the United States makes, rules the alliance and doesn't want to get involved in these things right now. So, you know, Turkey, with Turkey's strong response, it's really trying to then draw, lay the trap for the Syrians and then hire civilian casualties on the Turkish side. And then you come and say, look what's going on to, to, the, to the Western powers. As Tur Turkey's in a very bad dilemma right now. I would not want to... Uh, be in uh, Ankara at this point in time. And historic Aleppo? Uh, historic Aleppo, the, like, the, just what we've, I, I don't know, I have not seen those areas. What I've read, you know, the, the old city has been burned. There could be some damage to the Serral, you know, Saif al Dawla Serral, which is horrible. It's a beautiful place when I, when I visited there. And everybody that, that loves Syria, you know, loves the Middle East, loves Islamic monuments and whatever, we just, you know, we cry every day about what, what happened. We grieve. This gentleman in front. Thank you. Mark Katz from George Mason University. Barack, I want to thank you for a truly fascinating presentation. Uh, I'm intrigued by your suggestion that a, a solution might be to you know, allow the, uh, the regime to retreat to the Alawite uh, heartland on the coast. And I'd just like to press you on how we could uh, uh, incentivize them to do this. It strikes me that you know what what you're offering them is a is a carrot, but that in a situation like this, a stick has to be applied as well. In other words, that I think Peter referred to it that you know what what are we going what what can what can get them to actually accept this as a solution? Also, what do we know about the ethnic composition of this uh, coastal region? How Alawite is that region? In other words, is there a, another population there that's going to be pretty unhappy about? this and also just sort of the whole regional reaction to essentially what will be a you know, a de facto secession uh, how, how is this going to be responded to thank you this is why I always like to talk to my old friend Mark Katz he gives me these great ideas to think about um, basically what we need to do is uh, the, you, you're going to give them an incentive and hopefully at some point in time that they'll find out that everything is lost and they have to go in or you could threaten the use of force that you, you're going to escalate, the West is going to escalate and get involved, and then they realize that it's, it's going to be all over for them at that point in time, and then they have to move uh, into those areas that they realize, you know, somebody comes in, and, you know, the, the Barry Goldwater movement uh, with Nixon and says, it's, it's all over here. Um, they, they, the, 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 the problem is we, we, don't, we don't know how the regime functions, and we don't know who's making the decisions, and, and the, the regime at times is delusional in what it says and what it does. So uh, it, the, the, the option works on a, a rational uh, actor basis. And if the, the leader isn't rational, uh, then it's not going to get done. Um, I mean, is there any evidence that he's a non-rational actor? Yes, there is a lot of evidence that Bashar is not is a non-rational uh, actor. How, what would you say the main piece of evidence are? Oh, based on discussions of people, people who have met him and talked to him, uh, he says different things to different people. He's very moody. Um, there have been discussions of uh, some issues with him on that level. Like bipolar? Or, I mean, he'd be more explicit. I, 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 would, I would think that uh, that would hit the nail on the head. Hmm. Interesting. That's not, not really been much addressed in any of the coverage. Well, people don't really talk about things like that. I mean, you can't, you right. can't say those things with any certainty, and then uh, you bring in how do you, how, what gives yeah. you the, uh, the right to say things like that. But um, he uh, doesn't have the stability that we see with, uh, with others. Right. But it seems that, I mean, if you look at the, the exit strategies of the guys that have, been, that have gone, that only in Yemen has there really been a, a successful negotiated exit of the, the former president. And that there's a big, I think there are differences between Yemen and Syria that perhaps you can comment on. But I mean, Yemen was a somewhat democratic state by, the, by regional standards. I mean, there were pro political parties that had some degree of freedom. There was a more, it was an authoritarian democracy, for want of a better term. I mean, it was, it, 
Whereas... It was a pluralized authoritarian state. Right. So Syria seems to be a slightly different animal. I mean, it's, in Yemen, there was enough space to kind of ha come up with this compromise. Sure, there's nobody you can negotiate. The, 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 the regime can't negotiate with an opposition. No opposition existed. It was even worse than in, in Egypt. What, what happened is, in Egypt, is he, the ruler is a pharaoh. He rules without anybody. The last man that could have ever challenged uh, Mubarak was uh, Abu Ghazala, the defense minister, who was, was moved aside in the mid-1980s. Um, he wanted to become vice president, and he wasn't, and he had a fiefdom as a minister of defense. Uh, the regime never had any dealings with the opposition groups, such as uh, Tagamu, um, uh, the, social, uh, the Labor Party, and whatnot. They were just fig leaves. Yeah. They had no power, they, 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 and, and they, didn't, they didn't have that relationship. Um, so uh, he, and, and, but, and, but whereas in Yemen, the, the, he, Saleh, because the, the state is so weak, um, he always had contacts with these other parties. Um, but does that exist in Syria at all? Or no, there are, there are no political parties there. You're no. not going to get anything. Right. I mean, so that would suggest that it's going to be pretty hard to do the deal. But you'll no, no, no. You, you know, it's going to be a negotiation between the regime and the West. It's not yeah. going to be a regime and and and, and the you know the 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 rebels stand on behind the West and they say, okay, yeah, we'll do that. But you know. When we look at the Arab revolts, the Arab Spring, you know, only in, 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 in outside of Syria, only in Libya did we see violence. Tunisia fell fairly quickly. The, 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 the security forces wouldn't use violence against the protesters. Uh, only a few hundred died in Egypt, and that was before the tanks were, were rolled out. Um, uh, Yemen, they, he, used, he used violence as a tool to extract the concessions that, he, that Salah wanted. I mean, he knew he was out. He knew he couldn't continue, but he wanted to get those assurances that he needed. Only in Libya, when the, half the country was lost in a few days, uh, would we see you know, any level of violence that ap approximated uh, what happened in, in Syria. And that's because he was, Gaddafi was very upset, and he wanted to get his country back. So he, 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 he and the level of violence also was, was very low compared to what we saw in Syria. Everybody talked about that Benghazi would be massacred and whatnot. The, now that we know what, what happened in these areas under the, the loyalist the re regime's control, the level of violence used against Libyans was very low vis-a-vis -vis what we see in Syria, what the people do in Syria, which is just the ho most horrible atrocities. This gentleman over here. Yeah. Can, you wait, can you wait for the light? Oh, for the, the light. I'm Will Embry from DynCorp International, and that gives me the segue to the discussion about the uh, political opposition. The U.S. government uh, has been trying to talk to the SNC, you know, with the Turks. Uh, my understanding, and I hope you know more about this than I do, is that the SNC really uh, isn't an effective organization, and uh, which leads to the fact that there isn't anybody for the U.S. or Syria or the U.N. or anybody else really to talk to uh, about cutting a deal or finding some way out other than, uh, uh, you know, continuing bloodshed. I was wondering if you talk a little bit about the political opposition. Yeah, that's a great question. I, I didn't address that in my talk. Basically, the NC SNC is a great debating society. What, is, what does it stand for? The, uh, the Syrian National Congress is the opposition group uh, created. Um, in the aftermath of the revolution. These guys have no support on the ground. Uh, the people don't even know them, their names or their faces inside the country, and they really, frankly, don't care. Uh, they're not in the country. I mean, some of them have come in, they distribute some aid in the northern areas that have been liberated and are very quiet, but they're not, they're not anywhere close to the front lines. They're not creating the legitimacy that they need. And th these, they, there's a lot of fighting. A lot of them that I know have uh, resigned they're frustrated that the Islamists are taking over, or certain factions are, are being supported. Um, you know, Qatar and the French are trying to really uh, mold them into some type of cohesive organization. It's just not working. It's not going anywhere. So I don't think that you're going to see anything out of the uh, SNC uh, come out. Um, that said, there are certain people on the SNC that, you know, I think would be good, good leaders, the people that I've met. They have some good ideas. They're, they're upright individuals, and they don't have an agenda. They just have serious interests. But they, they just don't have the legitimacy on the ground to do anything uh, serious this time. Given all the uh, problems you describe in, these, in Syria and Libya and, to some degree, Egypt, uh, was the Arab awakening 
worth it? <laughs> well, you know, that's, that's a very tough question, Peter. It depends on where you stand and also depends w at what point in time you look at it. Um, these, these, the birth pangs of a new Middle East, as a, someone once said uh, in 2006, um, it's going to take a lot of time to transition. Uh, you need to, to really build institutions. And you can't just impose democracy. You, it would have been much better had it been transitioned, a transitional phase, stage. I remember when, um, when the Clinton administration came in office in 1992, they sent Robert Pellishaw, Assistant Secretary of State for Near East Affairs, to go talk to Mubarak. And he, they, wanted him to, you know, they wanted him to liberalize the regime. And he said, well, if I'm going to do that, the, the Islamists will take over. And that was the end of that. And then, then the Americans focused on peace process instead. We've, we've made mistakes in the Middle East. And we should have pushed for some type of opening that, so we could have had a process and not just something that just comes out of nowhere. And that is, that is a problem. And people are very frustrated in these societies and are not going to understand that the democracy takes time, that the regime, the, the, the governments aren't as strong on stability. You're already hearing a lot of backlash against uh, democracy in countries like Egypt and, and um, Libya. They want strong leadership. They want stability. It's sort of like the nostalgia for Stalin and Russia and certain parts of Russian society. Exactly, but that, that, that didn't happen with a year and a half after he was gone. But that did happen in, in Egypt when Ahmed Shafiq almost beat Mohamed Morsi because he was seen as a standard bearer of the former regime because he was a former uh, transportation, he was a general, he was a former transportation minister, and then Mubarak named him as prime minister of his last cabinet. You know, I guess Egypt um, could... Uh, is it, uh, you know, there are certain models of societies which are sort of, sort of somewhat democratic but also have a strong military. A successful model would be, uh, would be Turkey and a less successful model would be Pakistan right now. Uh, is Egypt perhaps even a less successful version of that? Well, the military is always going to be very strong in Egyptian society because, first of all, it, you talk about, they, they talk about the threat of Israel. They would need to have a strong military. The military also controls, I think, between 10 and 15 percent of the economy based on its factories. Um, the, 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 the military gets a, a good portion of, uh, of, of the, the budget for uh, defense spending. So you're always going to have a strong mil it, it, military in Egypt, and it's also the strongest state institution. When all else fails, you look to the military. Didn't have that in Libya. The Libya, the military, was, was just torn apart after the, the loss uh, uh, in the war against Chad in 1987. Gaddafi dismantled it. So you're going to always have that in Egypt. What I was surprised was the swiftness with which the military leadership, the SCAF, the Supreme Council of Armed Forces, who took over power after Mubarak fell, collapsed with such, with such uh, swiftness when Morsi came into power and he just, he just fired everybody. So... Um, that was very interesting. And perhaps heartening. Yes, that's also true that uh, it's forged a move toward democracy if you're going to have uh, that type of, uh, where you have the civilian leaders really assert their powers uh, so forcefully and, and early on. You know, in Pakistan in 2002, the pro-Taliban religious parties controlled two out of four of Pakistan's provinces. In 2008, they got 2% of the vote and they lost control. And they lost control basically because they hadn't delivered. So how would you sort of, s how would you see the fortunes of the Salafists? You sort of address that to some degree in your opening remarks, but how, how are they doing, or is it too large a movement to make any large sort of general prediction about them? They, are, they got obviously 25% of the vote. Uh, that implies that they're, you know, doing well in lots of parts of, of Egypt. How would you assess their political prospects, or is it too early to tell? Well, it is too early to tell. We, you know, we don't know what's happening with the parliament right now. Um, they, they can say, well, we didn't get ministries. Uh, they didn't give us any power. Um, but that said, th what can they deliver? And, I mean, they're not going to be able to reform uh, Egyptian society, the things that they want, they want the, the things that they want to put in the constitution, are are, are just shocking. Uh, um, uh, that you can't you can't have any type of uh, insulting to anything that has to do with uh, religion um, in 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 the country or whatnot. Uh, the the strictures that they want to impose uh, in society, that people aren't really going to go for that. 
and they're not going to be able to. Uh, so that's on the religious uh, side. And people want they want economic progress. People want jobs. They want an end to corruption. They want um, they want a more responsive government to the needs of society. And that's not going to happen because you don't get that with democracy. You need a change, a complete change in the way people think. You need to move from traditionalism to modernity. It's what called what uh, the, the Georgetown scholar Sham Sharabi called neo-patriarchy. You put a thin layer of modernity over traditionalism and you have create a neo-patriarchal society which doesn't result in any change. And that is the biggest problem. You know, on Monday, Mitt Romney gave what was billed as a major foreign policy address. And I thought one of the interesting ideas he had in there was that the United States should condition its $1.5 billion of aid um, to Egypt, uh, A, on, you know, that it maintains the peace treaty with Israel, and B, um, you know, that the democratic institutions are sort of built up. He didn't get into specifics, but, I mean, how would that go over in Egypt? Horribly, and that's a horrible idea. You're now going to stipulate the conditions for Egyptian aid, for aid, American aid. You're going to humiliate the Egyptians. You're going to spur nationalist uh, sentiment and feelings that the Americans want to keep you under their foot, and they have no respect for you as an equal and a partner. Egypt was our greatest ally in the last, uh, ever since the, the aftermath of the 1973 war when Henry Kissinger went to see Sadat and Sadat rolled the map on the table and he said the American, the Israelis will move our, your, their forces here and we will be able to move our forces here. That was the beginning of an American-Egyptian relationship. Well, you know, in a sense the aid was a quid pro quo for that defense treaty. For, for the yeah, it was, yeah, it was a quid pro quo for, the, for Camp yeah. David and you can't, we, you can't start stipulating democratic conditions for that. Do, do we really want to, to, to alienate the, the, our, our, it, when there's such instability in the region and we have so many problems? Do we really want to alienate the country that had been a pillar of American stability and support in the region? We need to work with the new leadership in a country like Egypt and find common goals and move towards them together hand in hand. Morsi seems to have said, I mean, it seems the Muslim Brotherhood position is that the peace treaty with Israel will sort of stand for the moment is that i mean what is their basic position oh that's not that's not gonna there's, there's going to be no movement on the treaty what they might want is some type of amendment amending or modification which will allow the military to move more forces in but the and that's what you hear on the street but the, the 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 problem and the funny thing with that is every time the israelis have allowed them to move more forces in they didn't do that i think the israeli i, I, I forgot the statistics i think the israelis allowed them to move i think seven battalions in I think it was in May. Into the Sinai? Into the Sinai, into, into Zone C, excuse me, into Zone C, which borders Israel. Um, they, they allowed, and, and I think, 20 tanks. But the, the Egyptians never did that. Historically, historically since the, the, the Egyptians took over the, the Sinai, they've only stationed about 75% of the forces they were allowed to under Camp David Accords. So in, in your view, there's almost... It's extremely unlikely that the peace treaty with Israel, between Israel and Egypt, would be in any way be significantly changed, amended. No, no, no they, 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 they changed or amended. They may want to get more forces in there now because of the situation, but they're, they're working on it. There's right. a bi they're bilateral working on it. Now, when we talk about if there's going to be a problem between Israel and Egypt, my greatest fear is they're both moving forces into these regions. Israel because it has to shore up against jihadist incursions, and the Egyptians because they have this jihadist problem. When the when the when what happened I think in August 2011 when the when there's a jihadist incursion into Israel, when the Israelis respond in hot pursuit and they killed the um, the Egyptian guards, it created a real big conflagration in Egypt, which led to the storming of the Israeli embassy. Tensions are very, very high. They, the both sides need to work to reduce that. So there's not this type of isolated incident or event that could lead to a real, real big problem. Put the lady here and then the two gentlemen there. Thanks. Hi, Josanth Planer with Public International Law and Policy Group. Um, what role and prospects do you see for um, U.S. influence in the region, um, especially given the security problems in the recent embassy attacks and the challenges of weak governance and weak institutions? I think a great book to read on that is the Not 
uh, Too Much Promised Land uh, by Aaron David Miller. He has a great section in there on how strong we think we are in the region and what we can get done and what we really, what the people on the ground think we can get done. Or we cannot get much done. We need to work with our allies. Uh, we need to talk to uh, local intelligence uh, services, and that's been the big problem now. We've lost the contacts in these, in these intelligence services that really provided us information about the bad guys. Well, but at a huge cost to, I mean, uh, you know, it's not like we're, there's any great nostalgia for you know, the Libyan Mukhabarat or the Egyptian Mukhabarat, right? Well, the thing is, we had a great relationship with Musa Kusa. Right. He was giving us all. And, you know, he, at the end of his life, Gaddafi was really a tolerated nuisance. Um, when Condoleezza Rice visited, I think it was in 2006, 2007, it was the highest ranking American to visit Libya since, I think, Nixon's visit, Vice President Nixon's visit in 1957 or 1958. There was a really a, a big about face. And that was the big policy, foreign pol Middle East foreign policy achievement that the Bush administration uh, put forward, that they had... Um, that they, 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 they brought Libya back in from the cold. And that was what we had there. Yes, there were, there were a lot of human, there were human rights violations, and yes, there were a lot of problems. But that didn't change the fact that our intelligence services really benefited from the coordination that they had. Well, but, I mean, in a sense, the whole jihadi al-Qaeda problem was really, a, in some ways, a fruit of these intelligence services as much as anything else. I mean, it's not an accident that Saeed Qutub wrote his critical you know, tax milestones while he was in... Sure, of course. Right. And they, they, they played a very large role in that. And it's not an accident that Ayman al-Zawari became more radicalized after his three years in prison. And, and I mean, we can give you there's many other examples. Abu Musab al-Zakawi became radicalized in a Jordanian prison. No, I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with all those examples, yeah. and you're 100% right. But so it raises a big, the, really the big question for all this is, you know, if you accept the idea, and I think it's uncontroversial, that you know, Al-Qaeda and groups like it really came a result of these authoritarian regimes. Um, many of these regimes are, are going, which suggests more political space for Islamists, which may, in, we hope, not turn violent. And, uh, you know, that's, that's a hope, um, but I think it's a reasonable one. Oh, would it have been better to have none of these democratic openings and these regimes still in place who also brutally repressed these groups, but also in a way created them? Or is there some other sort of... Sure. We're ta we're, like I said earlier, it depends where you're looking at it and at what time frame you're looking at it. We're looking at it the right short term immediate right yeah. after these revolutions and we see the September 11 tax and we say, you see, this is the problem. Yeah. This is what happens. This is why these things were not good. In 10, in, in 10 20 years in, in the next generation, the, 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 the societies will transition to more to strong democratic uh, states with strong state institutions, with more security stability, and then everybody's going to be happy with the flowers that... Well, happy uh, enough. Well, that, that bloomed. Uh, but going back to one of your points about the political Islam, I said you've given them space. The problem is that a lot of people are going to be disgruntled with the, what, what the political Islamists were able to accomplish. The, you know, the, 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 the real hardcore people, that the, 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 the pious. And they'll say, well, these, they're just as bad. They didn't, get, they, didn't, they didn't get for us what we wanted. So they'll become disenchanted and disillusioned. And then the Al-Qaeda Al ideas, or the Salafist ideas that said you, the democracy is an idol. Uh, Abu Yahya Libi, uh, his, I think it was a two uh, uh, 2009 speech, Democracy the Contemporary or the Modern Idol. Um, where you have you know, uh, people like um, Abu, uh, Ab uh, Abu Muhammad al Maktasi's, um, uh, I can't remember the name of his, his, uh, his lecture. These guys all talked about democracy as being a, a new form of idol worship. Yeah. They will, they'll be able to say, you see, we told you about this decade. Well, in Iraq, you know, for all the, you know, I mean, Iraq, there's been a sort of experiment with, about a lot of these same issues. I mean, where do you see the jihadists in Iraq right now? The problem with the jihadists in Iraq was Abu Musab al Zarqawi overplayed his hand. Right. It was have they come back? Have they, is there, do they have any sort of validity now? Have they changed their ways? Or they it's too soon for society to forgive them for what they did in the bloodletting. Yeah. And I think that that lesson is also, you know, I think. If you look at a turning, I think one of the turning points in Al Qaeda's fortunes was the attack on the three American owned hotels in Amman, Jordan in 2005, which killed um, mostly, or almost entirely, Jordanians attending a wedding. That got widespread coverage in the Arab world. 
Um, so I think there were, it's not just in Iraq where people saw what, what an Al-Qaeda-like regime would impose on the population. Uh, I think that was, I mean, around the Muslim world, I think this got, well, there was quite a lot of understanding of this. Sure, it, it, I was in Amman, uh, I think about a month after that, and people were very upset. I mean, the, he, Abu uh, Musa al zarqawis tribe disowned him. They took out uh, page ads in the papers, full page ads in the papers, denouncing the attacks. There was a, there was a real backlash a, against that. But you see that you see a lot of that in in the country where an attack is carried out. Pe people people usually support attacks outside their countries. Well, they talk about Benghazi. What happened in Benghazi after the attack on the consulate? Well, Benghazi is very different. In Libya is very different because because they're very supportive of the West for what they did in overthrowing Gaddafi, as opposed to the other countries where they didn't. No one no one asked for American aid and nobody got it, uh, a military support. But my, my point is, I was, I was in, um, in, I used to live in Yemen, and in Yemen, people were very supportive of, uh, of attacks against the Americans, military in Iraq, of attack against American uh, civilians. Uh, they were supportive of the 9-11 attacks. But the day that there was an attack, in Yemen, that AQA Al Qaeda sponsored. Although that's bad, we can't. Have Same it. thing happened in Saudi Arabia in two thousand and three. But um, let's have another question over here. I'm Ray, Mc I'm Ray, McGo Ray McGovern, veteran intelligence professionals for Sanity. I'd like to broaden the discussion to Russia. Um, I used to know a lot about Russia, and I think I remember they were very interested in Syria. How serious do you think the Russians consider what's happening there in Syria? And what's the word on the street or in diplomatic circles as to how far the Russians will go to keep propping up al-Assad? I can't really talk about Russian foreign policy. That's not my specialty. I, I have a friend who's very good at it, but that's not something I can, I'm sorry. Okay. Did you have a question, sir? Yeah. I'm Mike Beard, and I wonder what is the role that uh, Iran is playing in the area? Excellent. Uh, Iran is playing uh, a big role in supporting the, um, the Syrians. Uh, we know that they're, that, uh, they're training them. Um, they're offering uh, uh, all types of aid. They really need, they can't allow Syria to fall because Syria is the country to send weapons to Hezbollah, which is Syria, uh, li, uh, um, Iran's really big ally in the region that it uses to exert uh, 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 influence and power against the threat to threat, threaten the Israelis. Uh, so it's not; it doesn't it will do everything in its power to um, to sustain the, the Syrian regime. However, it doesn't have the money that it would want to have because of the sanctions regime against it. Uh, its economy is really being pummeled. The real is falling by the day. It has a lot of internal instability problems. So it can't extend the aid, all the aid that it wants to. But it will give them the logistical support and the military training to help them. And we've heard, um, we've heard rumors that they're, uh, that they're training the Shabiha, the paramilitary the units, uh, Alawi units that go around and um, indiscriminately kill people. So there's a lot of um, uh, evidence of that, a lot of talk about that at this point in time. By the way, how are Alawites regarded by sort of mainstream Shia? They're not very, they're not very happy with them either. Uh, historically, it sort of seems funny that a sort of ideologically Shia regime would be basically supporting a group that they really regard as heretics. No, well, see, it wasn't religious. Um, it, it was, it was more uh, born of pragmatic pragmatism and necessity when they started the when they started the relationship. Um, the Iraqi, the Iranians needed an ally bec uh, when um, Iraq started the war with them. So uh, they were able to reach out to them because all the whole region was against them. Uh, the Gulf countries. Uh, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and whatnot, they were very scared, and they used Iraq, they, fought, they supported Iraq as the shield, uh, the protector of, of their interests against the Iranians, and that's when the Americans were brought in after the Gulf War. Um, but the, the, when we look at the shia Alawi relationship, what happened is, beginning at the end of the Ottoman era, um, uh, the Ottomans tried to bring in 
the Alawis under the, Islam, the Islamic foe because they were scared that the French would um, claim that they were lost Christians. Uh, a French, uh, a French, um, a French priest, uh, Henri Lamont, who was a great Orientalist, claimed that these were lost Christians, so they were afraid that the French would claim them. Then what happened is the, the whole issue became politicized with when um, certain um, Islamic scholars uh, gave fatwas or legal issue, legal opinion, saying that the Alawis were Muslims. Uh, the Mufti of, Jer of Jerusalem, uh, Hajj Husseini, uh, issued a fatwa, I think in the 1940s, saying that. And then Assad was able to get uh, Musa al-Sadr, the vanished imam, who was related to Mukta al-Sadr, to issue a, a fatwa in the mid-1970s, saying that the Alawis were Twelvers, uh, uh, Twelvers saying that they were Shia. Um, uh, so, and we also saw this, uh, in, I think in the 20s and 30s, maybe in the 30s and 40s, they started sending their, their youngsters to study in the seminaries, and I think in Najaf is where it was. So there was, a, there was, a, there was a, um, an integration of the Alawis into the Shi'i fold. They came back with books and whatnot, of uh, Shi'i books. But the Alawis have never been considered uh, Shi'is. They're, they are, what happened is, um, there, in Shiism, there's two groups. There's called uh, Twelvers, which is the mainstream that predominates in Bahrain, Iran, Iraq, and Lebanon. And then you have Seveners. They were extremists. Uh, and they based had 12 imams and seven imams, where you cut off on the imam. These were extremists. And they, uh, they preponderate now in uh, some areas in, in uh, Lebanon and Yemen and, and Syria and Aga Khan in India is, is a sevener. Uh, they are an offshoot of these people and they deify Ali. Uh, I mean, if you read some of these Alawi texts, it's just, you, it's amazing what, what, what they say. So they, they are really outside the Islamic fold. They're, they're, they don't land with, within any type of normative Islam. I mean, the Shia are heterodox, but these people are just heretics. <laughs> any other questions? Gentleman here. Adam Gianella, Heritage Foundation. I was just wondering your thoughts on aid to Libya and if we're giving enough or should we give more? And what kind of aid? Yeah, it's a great question. The thing is with Libya, it, Libya doesn't need any aid because it has all that oil wealth. It needs um, help in building uh, institutions. It needs experts and trainers to build a, um, a good judiciary system, bring in judges. Um, you need to bring in people to uh, move, build up technical capacity that, that is non-existent. And Egypt, Libya's oil, uh, oil money it can, can support all that. Anything the Libyans need, they can get on their own. They just don't have the, the experience necessary, the government experience. Barack, you know, the Libyan Islam Islamic Fighting Group, which was sort of once aligned with al-Qaeda, is really the first um, affiliate of, of al-Qaeda which has ever really done a peace deal with a regime, with a regime. And that was, of course, they did a peace deal with Gaddafi. To what extent is that peace deal sort of held? Are the Libyan Islamic fighting group, did they lay down their arms? Are they involved in jihadist activity? What is happening with that group? Oh, sure. They've pretty much, uh, they, 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 they've accepted um, uh, to play by the democratic rules. You know, every, everyone talked about Abdul Hakim Belhaj. Uh, he's, he's part of a political party. Um, you have, uh, I think, Abu Yahya Libby's brother. He's a member of another party. I think uh, Amun's there, the ideologue is also played by the political game. Everyone at the beginning of the revolution talked about a guy named Abu Hakim al-Hasadi in Darna. Uh, he is a security official uh, in Darna. Um, there have been some extremists such as Sufyan al-Gumu, Sufyan ben Gumu, excuse me, who was uh, Libyan. LIFG was, uh, was uh, they say he was uh, bin Laden's driver. He was detained in, at uh, Guantanamo Bay. He's um, clung to some elements of his extremism. We're not sure if he was involved in what happened on September 11th or not. I, I don't think so. Uh, but by and large, the LIFG has really, just like the, the, the Gamal Islami and the Jihad in Egypt, they've, they've renounced violence and they've moved into the uh, mainstream society. There's a, somebody in the back over here with a question. Any other questions? Sir? If I could get a, a second question. Uh, uh, you look at uh, the various transitions that have gone on in Libya and Syria, the leadership, to me, doesn't have any exit. You know, they're going to 
they're going to get shot. Their followers are going to get shot and run out of town. Uh, uh, we're in Tunisia and Yemen, certainly, and, and uh, also s somewhat in, in Egypt. Uh, there, w there was an exit, an exit strategy for them. Could you talk about uh, the, the supporters of al-Assad and you know, they see their backs to the wall and, and they have to fight to the death or they're going to be uh, killed in other ways? Uh, is, is there any way out of it? Yeah, it's a big problem. Uh, basically, the regime is, is just feeding the Alawis the most horrible stories about the Sunnis and what they want to do to them. I've talked to Alawis inside, talked to Alawis that got out. Um, so these people really feel that like they're back against the wall and they're going to be slaughtered. And it's just a doomsday scenario for them, uh, the Alawis. The other minorities, uh, you know, you're talking about Christians, many Christian groups. What's and the percentage of the Christian population? I can't, I think it's up the top of my head, I think it's between 10 and 12 percent. So to, significant. Yeah, no, no, it, they're not, it's not a small population. Uh, it's pretty big and you're talking, it's not, it's not, it's not cohesive because, you know, you're talking about Greek Orthodox, you're talking about uh, Syrian Christians, you're talking about uh, small numbers of Protestant um, and, and whatnot, uh, Nestorians. Uh, so um, these, these groups, uh, and also the Druze, uh, in, in Jabal Druze, um, they've supported the regime. Their members are their their members are part of the security services, so they are also scared at the same time. Barack, this has been a really deep, uh, well reported, and and also you took a lot of risks to gather this information. So we're very grateful that you came and spoke to us about it. Well, the original person that took the risk was Peter when he traveled <laughs> to Afghanistan. And that was all a long time ago. Yeah. Well, so I want to.